Morning. Yep. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about uh, building a board of farm uh, for continuous integration. And our main point uh, is to show you how to do it uh, for maybe for example, integration into kernel CI, uh, or to be able to use it for other purposes. Uh, so we'll show you mainly what is a continuous integration and which part you have to do if you want to build a firm of board uh, in your own company or at home. Okay. So let us present ourselves first. Uh, Quentin. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Quentin. Uh, I've done my um, end of studies internship at Free Electron and I've joined them, joined them uh, in September, so now I'm an engineer at Free Electron. So basically my internships, internship subject was the subject of the talk, so I can legit, uh, legitimately talk about that. So I'll let uh, uh, Antoine continue with the slides. So, as he said, we work at Free Electrons. Uh, we are a company based in France, and well, just a few words about it. Uh, we are providing services for embedded Linux, um, so SOC support, uh, drivers, and we are also doing uh, trainings in the same uh, area, so in embedded Linux uh, or some uh, of the tools that are um, related to it, like Yocto or Buildroot. Um, we both uh, live in Toulouse, which is in the southwest of France. Um, and I am also working at Free Electrons, of course. I was involved in two the same project, uh, but Quentin did most of the work. I just had a look, uh, well, from a far point of view, uh, but, well, I know w what was going on uh, still. So um, this is uh, the contents we will uh, talk about. Uh, first, we'll have uh, an introduction on what is um, Continuous integration, so just to have in mind, uh, to have a clear view of what we're talking about. Uh, then we'll see the component uh, of a continuous integration and which one of them we'll have to build to have a form, uh, a firm of board in our company. Uh, and then we'll dive into the main subject, uh, which is well, what we did at Free Electrons to have a board of farm, uh, a farm of board uh, to be integrated into kernel CI, but also to be used uh, for other purposes. And we'll show you one of them, which is a tool we built uh, on top of it uh, to control the board remotely. Okay. Um, so introduction, just to have uh, the same uh, view of what is a continuous integration. Um, um, so it's a software engineering practice in which uh, we will test changes immediately after we made them to be sure it's not breaking the project. Um, basically, when you have a large project, uh, you may have uh, you may work on a small part which can impact uh, many other uses of it, um, but you are not able to test it. So continuous integration will help you to test it on many. Uh, uh, different use cases uh, with different configuration and in our case uh, for embedded Linux on many boards. Um, for, um, so the goal of this is to catch uh, bugs or regression early to be able to fix it before we, we make a new release of uh, our project. Um, so in a continuous integration you have three main components. Uh, we will have a clear look at it. Uh, during the next slides to just understand what are these components. But basically, you will have continuous build, uh, a test automation part, and then uh, processing of the results. So why do we need it um, when speaking of the Linux community? Um, we have a lot of different platforms supported by uh, the Linux kernel, and, may, and this is especially true for ARM because we have like many, many SOCs uh, that can share some IPs. So if I make a change uh, in one driver uh, that can impact uh, some other platform and I may not be able to test it on the other platforms. Um, so this is why it's really hard to test it uh, in our community. Um, so having a continuous integration can really help to, to find bug early or to find regression early to be able to fix it uh, and not break other platforms. Also, we are in a community very active, so we have a lot of changes. Uh, we have a new Linux release every two months, and in each release we have uh, thousands and thousands of changes. So that means we can have uh, also lots of bugs in it. Um, this is not a problem, but we just have to detect them. Okay. 
Um, there are other projects to uh, that aim to detect um, a regression or bug early, like uh, Intel Zero Day, but this was mainly done for x86 platforms, uh, so it's really useful, but not really for ARM. Um, and Intel Zero Day was not able to boot uh, a lot of kernels uh, on ARM boards, so this is why uh, we also needed something specific for ARM. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we need it as a community for Linux, uh, but then at the company you also have uh, you also need it. So why do we need it? Needed it at Free Electrons. Um, we contribute to lots of ARM platforms upstream. Uh, so this means uh, we can be impacted uh, by lots of bugs, and we also have uh, a lot of different boards uh, that maybe nobody else have. Uh, so it can be really good to to well. Uh, allow the community to be able to test uh, regression on these boards. Um, we also cooperate with some ARM uh, vendors, so it can be good for, for our business to catch bug early, uh, to just ensure that um, the mainline uh, kernel is still working for these processors. And well, we also have maintainers, uh, ARM maintainers for ARM and ARM64, uh, so it can be also uh, useful uh, in this position to catch bugs early. Uh, and finally, well, we try to keep uh, track of the modification of the platform we maintain uh, to be able to, well, to just know it just work. Um, so this was the um, generic part about what is the continuation integration and why do we need it. Um, now I will dive into um, uh, what are the components of a continuous integration to really understand what we're talking about? Uh, but it's not uh, yet uh, specific to kernel CI. It can be applied to any continuous integration uh, implementation. So we we find uh, again the three parts I was talking about, uh, which is the continuous build, the test automation, and the processing of the result uh, of the test. So basically, the first part will be. Um, um, responsible to track uh, for changes in well our project. So there are many ways to track to track them. Uh, we will show you uh, how it's done with kernel CI. Um, and then when a change is detected uh, in our project, we can uh, trigger some builds to build actual images to be able to test it. Um, and then this build will be tested by the test automation part, uh, which will be actually our farm of board. So when we are speaking about our farm of board, of board at Free Trends, we implemented uh, this part. So the test, the test automation part. Okay. Once you launch, you launched uh, your test. You want to gather the result to be able to know if there was uh, or were any bugs or regression on it. And so this is uh, the processing part. So you need to gather other other results uh, to be able to detect if it was uh, a regression, a bug, or uh, well, something normal. Um, so this was um, the generic part about what how, it's, uh, how you build a continuous integration um, process. But then uh, we will have a look at what kernel CI is doing because we did a border farm which is not only used in kernel CI, but which is also used in kernel CI, so it's really good to understand uh, how kernel CI is working to be able to add a new farm of board into kernel CI. So let's first present what is kernel CI. Kernel CI uh, is responsible of the continuous build part and the processing part uh, of the results, but not about the test automation part, okay? So if you want to be able to integrate, uh, well, a, board, a, fair, a form of board into kernel CI, you need to implement uh, this part, but you don't need to do this one or this one. It's already done for you, um, and that, made, that makes the, the thing really easy to do. Uh, kernel CI, um, so it's a project which was started, uh, I guess, three years ago? Yes? Two years ago? Okay, two years ago. <laughs> Uh, you can find uh, many information on the website, and you can also see all the results of all the tested, which were made by kernel CI on this website. Uh, the aim of this project is to detect uh, regression uh, before uh, they reach users. So we try to 
detect early regression uh, by testing every day, every hour uh, for new changes uh, to be able to catch them. Um, for example, per day there is uh, more than 2,000 boot tests uh, on more than 200 uh, unique boards. So, the first part of it is to track uh, for new changes. Um, there are many ways to do it. Uh, in kernel CI, it's tracking Git repositories uh, every hour uh, to detect new changes. And the way it's doing it uh, is it will uh, uh, download the latest version of a given repository each hour and see if new commits uh, were pushed to it. If there are new commits uh, in this repository, uh, this will trigger a new build to be able to test these new uh, modifications. Uh, in kernel CI, it will track uh, more than 20 Git repositories. Uh, so there is a well-known uh, Linux, uh, Linux tree. And then you also have ARM SOC, Linux Next, uh, Linux, Next Linux Table, on, for example, Net -ne NetNext, but also other branches. This is good because it allows you to track uh, for regression into the official uh, Git tree of the kernel, which is the Linux one, but also for changes that will be integrated into this tree before it's pulled on merge into this tree. So for example, if you track uh, for regression into uh, ARM SOC, then you will be able to detect bugs into ARM SOC before it, reach, uh, it reaches uh, the Linux tree. So once a change was detected uh, into a given repository uh, that is tracked by kernel CI, a build is triggered. Um, and basically, it will build uh, all dev configs for ARM, ARM64, uh, and some for x86. Uh, and of course, uh, there are associated device trees, if any, uh, to be able to actually test these images on the board. MIPS2? OK, so MIPS2 now. This is good. <laughs> um, and this is the interesting part. If you happen to have a lab uh, in your company, this is when you, you well, you join the game. Uh, so kernel CI will uh, track for new changes. It will trigger a build to build a kernel with these new changes inside it to be able to test it. And then it will send uh, these images and the test to do on, with these images to the labs. So, for example, to the labs at Free Electrons. Uh, and, well, this part will be uh, uh, responsible to test it and to actually, uh, well, test it. And then, once uh, it's done, kernel CI will gather the results uh, to, be able to be able to detect uh, new failures uh, or new regressions. Um, so we had the, a view of what kernel CI is doing. Um, if you just go back one slide. Um, and we, we know now that uh, this part and this part is already done, so you don't have to do anything if you want to be part of it, but you will need to be able to, well, to build a farm, uh, which is the test automation part. And this is what we're going to talk about now. So the test automation uh, will be the part uh, responsible to control the board, um, to launch uh, test is on the board, and also to gather the results from the board. Okay, not to gather the entire results of all the tests because this will be kernel CI jobs, but to gather uh, well a particular test on the given board. And this um, part uh, will be well will be the the firm of board. Okay, so you will be able to have uh, one component which will control uh, all of your board in your company to do these things. So this implies, um, well, many things to implement. But um, well, Quentin will uh, told you about will uh, talk about this. Okay. Uh, one thing to notice in kernel CI. Um, is it's compatible with one particular software which was developed uh, by Linaro uh, and called Lava. So if you want to do the test automation part for kernel CI, then you most likely will need to, to install Lava to control your board. OK. OK, so now I will talk about the Lava then, because it's the, the missing part for the automation, autom automation uh, lab. So. Um, Lava is a, a self-hosted uh, software um, which aims to control boards. 
so it uses external tools. So uh, basically, uh, you you tell him you you should use this software to power on or off a board, and also how to um, get a serial. So Lava is working with a um, Certunet or Convex, and for the for the um, the power uh, control, you can use a PDU uh, daemon, which is uh, developed also by uh, Linaro, or you can use your own uh, custom software. Um, it also automates boot, bootloader user space uh, testing, so that implies um, tests. So you have to tell him what to test, how to test it, and which images to test. So, as, uh, as Antoine said, uh, Kernelsia is sending tests. So, it just, uh, it just tells you where to find the images. So, the images uh, Kernelsia built, and you will have to then download it. It's, it's just lava work to do. So, um, you can basically do anything you want in lava. So, uh, for example, uh, yet Kernelsia is uh, testing the user space. Uh, but you could also test how the, the bootloader is working, the environment via variable in it. Um, basically, the tests are called jobs. Uh, so it's important if you look at the Lava documentation. Um, it runs tests simu simultaneously on all boards. So you don't have to wait a, bo uh, a board to have finished to test the, the next one. Uh, it also provides API for full automation. Well. <laughs> You need it, because otherwise uh, Kernelsia wouldn't work with it. So uh, basically, if you don't want to work with Kernelsia, that's a shame, but you can do it. Um, so basically, you can hook it with a Git hook or something like that, to, or your own Jenkins uh, instance to test it. So um, Lava is also validating tests. So that's how uh, they know uh, if, uh, if a board is failing the boot job or not. So that's what Canasia kind of is uh, gathering. So you can check the wiki at wiki.linaro.org slash Leva. So that will help you, I guess. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so next. Uh, so as I said, Lava is a self uh software. It's organized in a master dispatchers fashion. So what does that mean? So that means that uh, only one master is working with several dispatchers. So the master is controlling the farm. That's um, uh, currency will just send jobs to uh, the master of Lava. So the master is handling the, the API and receive the test to run. It will also schedule the test to run. So uh, as I said, it's working with dispatchers. So uh, it will re uh, receive the test and then find the dispatcher to which it should, it should send the test. So the given dispatchers will handle a set of boards. So each dispatcher has, I mean, unique boards. So you don't have uh, to uh, care about that. So only a board will, will be only in one dispatcher. Uh, so every dispatcher has the configuration of each board it owns. And it's physically connected to the board. So, um, that means that if uh, a board is connected to a dispatcher, this dispatcher should be able to control the power and the serial. Um, I mean, in our case, that's not really important because uh, the master and the only dispatcher we have is on the same machine. So uh, we'll have everything on the same uh, computer. <laughs> OK, he tricked me on this one. Um, so, what is, uh, how does Lava work? Internally, I mean. Um, so, as I said, uh, you have to control the power. So, that's uh, done with, uh, with uh, PDU diamond, so on top, with power relays. I will just uh, uh, show later. And uh, for the serial, uh, it will just redirect the output to um, a Telnet uh, instance with a uh, Certunet. And uh, you will be able to get uh, files on the board with GFTP. So um, for that, you need, as I said, a configuration file. So Lava is just working with configuration configuration file. Sorry. 
Um, well, uh, an important thing, oh, well, I will just say that uh, later. Um, no, sorry. The configuration file will have everything for each port. So, in one configuration file for one device, we'll have how to power it, how to connect to the serial, and uh, where to find it. Uh, an important note, uh, there is two versions of Lava. So V1 and V2 in the documentation, we'll see. Um, the V1 is working with configuration file. The V2 is working with API. You will not have any configuration file on the, on the machine. But the V2 of Lava is working, um, is getting tests in uh, YAML um, uh, templates files while the V1 is working with JSON. And Canary is only doing with the JSON uh, test now. So we, need, we still need to uh, be on the V1, which will be maintained for at least a year or two. And then, fortunately, we will have to uh, uh, migra migrate to the, to the next one. So um, it's important to know that um, Devices, so boards, are uh, split into uh, two different uh, categories. So you have the device type and a device. So the device is uh, the device configuration file is the, the configuration file used to con uh, used to tell where to find um, the serial. So on the last con uh, on the last line, so connection command. Uh, how to pour, in, uh, pour it off or on, so hard reset command and pour off command. Uh, so basically it's just um, for pour off and hard reset command, it's only uh, calling an external tool. So you can just put whatever shell commands you want. So here we have a PDU client, which is a, a part of PDU daemon. And uh, then on top you have device type, so that's... Uh, <laughs> I will just introduce the next slide. So, device type is a, is a set of the of same devices. So, for example, say we have um, a chip. We have 10 chips. So, uh, you will have uh, 10 device configuration files to say where I should find the, the um, serial of which board. And then you will have you will have uh, a common device type configuration. So that's uh, all the commands you will have uh, to enter, to execute in the bootloader. So it's, everything is automated. You just have to, to uh, set the, the right uh, command in the bootloader. So for example, you have uh, zload addresses, which are the uh, RAM addresses for the, the kernel address. Uh, the kernel, sorry, then the rootfs, uh, init ramfs, and then the DTB. And uh, a lot of um, variables are filled in with, uh, via Lava automatically. So, for example, kernel address, RAM disk address, everything. So, uh, basically, that's everything here is shared uh, between all chips. So, yeah, I think that's it for configuration files. Uh, how uh, tests run in Lava now? So, uh, as I said, oh, not really. Uh, Lava is not autonomous. You have to uh, use its API to achieve full automation. So, for example, with Githooks, with Jenkins instance, or for example, to be a part of uh, Canarsia Labs. So, the user part is our job, or Canarsia jobs, or your Githooks job. Uh, this user will send jobs, so uh, a set of kernel DTB and its RAMFS. Um, to uh, to run on a device type one, it will just send that to uh, a Lava server, a master, and so the server will uh, receive the test job. Uh, it will ask the dispatchers, so all the available dispatchers, if they have a device available for uh, uh, of type. Uh, sorry, if they have a device of device type one, for example, uh, is available. If not, then it chooses the jobs. And we'll ask later for uh, for um, a device, an available devices. And if it is available, if there is an available uh, device, it will send jobs to the dispatcher uh, in charge of this device. So the dispatcher will download everything from remote. 
So, for example, uh, in kernel CI uh, storage, it will apply the modification. For example, for all bo uh, boards, you will only have, uh, I don't know, uh, UImage uh, support, so with a uh, boot M. You need the uh, U-boot header for the, the NitroMFS. And then we will start recording, entering the bootloader, executing all the commands, and it will uh, power, off, power on the, the board and yeah, run the test. Then we will stop the, the recording and send record to the server, or the server will get the records from Lava. And um, everything is stored, of course, in the Lava server. So it's always, it's permanent. So I think it's everything for Lava. So next slide, a bit more interesting. Um, so it's the hardware. How do we actually build the the farm? I mean, it's not the the, the previous part was mainly configuration. So yeah, uh, I just explained how it works, but not really development or I didn't invent anything. So that's now part of the hardware. So I will just present the, the hardware. So as I said, you have to control the power. So uh, that was the hardest part, I think. So power supply control, you have three choices. So uh, PDU, so power distribution unit, it's often rackable, so you can put it in a, in a server rack. Uh, it's really expensive, it's 500 euros uh, at least. Way, way. <laughs> way more what you can uh, afford for, for a lab. And uh, so, no, not really. And it's also using uh, cater calls, I would say. So the, the sockets. So you have to buy adapters to, uh, for your chargers. So it's, yeah, not really a good idea. Then you have on the right the figure ne the network controlled multi socket. So the problem with that one is the, well, later I will explain, we, we chose to have eight boards per, uh, whatever, drawers. So we need a power supply with eight sockets. And the main problem with the, uh, was that um, this network control multi-socket has um, an eight socket uh, version only on the US sockets, and we are living in Europe, so uh, we'll need uh, a lot of adapters. Yeah, no. So then you ha we have the, the last option, remotely controlled relays. Uh, for that, we have... Uh, Ethernet controlled, uh, USB controlled, Wi-Fi controlled, uh, Bluetooth controlled, everything controlled, basically. So uh, it's relays and yeah, it's just wires. So you cut your chargers, you put in it, and yeah, it works. So uh, obviously we chose the last one. Um, well, it's really cheap. So for example, the, the PU I said was uh, at least 500 euros. On the right, it was uh, at least one one hundred and twenty dollars, and this one is, uh, I would say, eighty pounds. So yeah, ninety euros. Um, yeah, we have a lot of ports. So basically, this uh, model is an eight-port relay, but you have also a two, four, eight, sixteen, and thirty-two version. So yeah, you can basically do anything you want. It's really small, so you can see. Uh, uh, comparatively to the um, Ethernet port. And we chose the TCP one because we have already a lot of uh, USB hubs. So, yeah, no, I don't, I don't want uh, another USB uh, control device. And they support virtually any power supply. As I said, you just have to cut the charger and put the, the wires in it. So, that's really more interesting than the, 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 the two uh, different choices I presented earlier. So, now, I know how to, to control the power supply, but how does really the power supply work? Um, I mean, it was easy to say, uh, I'll cut the wire and I'll put in it, but then I will have to uh, throw, out, uh, throw out a lot of uh, charges for that. Not really a good idea. So, uh, to think a better, uh, of a better idea, uh, we had to uh, notify the several uh, devices we have in the, in the farm, so, in the world, I mean, it's basically all the boards are in either of the, the three categories. So we have a 5 volt board, uh, boards, the 12 volt powered boards, and the full ATX powered boards. So, yeah, embedded, but not really. Um, 
We separate those in two kinds, so the non ATX supplied boards, so the 5 volt and 12 volt, and the ATX uh, supplied boards. So basically, they, um, the one in the two kinds of uh, boards uh, shares the same way of uh, being supplied. So, next one non ATX supplied power, uh, board. Sorry. Uh, we need two different input voltages, so 5 volt or 12 volt. So, two choices. Either I find um, a charger, we can output both at the same time, or I will have to have one power supply per voltage, so uh, one for 5 volt and one for 12 volt, and it has to have enough amperage. Why? Because I would like to uh, avoid having eight charges per hours, I will show you later. So to gain space on the farm, I'd say we, we, we just have one charger for all the boards on the same drawers and just split the output. So that's why we need uh, enough amperage. For example, if you have uh, eight boards on five volt, you will need at least, I would say, 10 amperes to pour everything. And for example, if we need to test later, not yet, but later, uh, hard disk, yeah, hard disk drive. Uh, you will need a lot of amperage at the start because of the spin uh, of the of the hard disk drive. So uh, basically, we chose uh, to have one power supply for all voltages, and the only uh, charger I would say which is doing that is ATX power supplies. So yeah, next slide, please. Um, I don't know if you knew, but at the exposure supply, output a lot of uh, different voltages. So you have the 3.3 volt, 5 volt, 12 volt, minus 12 volt, and uh, continuous 5 volt uh, uh, output. And so you can just uh, pick anything on the on the output and split it. So now I'm happy. I have only one charger per drawer. So uh, I will just cut the the output of the ATX power supply and then split it in different uh, relays and uh, power all the boards. And to protect that, because you know ATX power supply is not really, uh, no, everything is uh, unre unrealable, so uh, I add a TVS diode, so the, the principle is to explode if there is only any over voltage, so that will just secure uh, a bit the the system. So, um, the ATX power supply is what you have in your computer, uh, and your computer is not always powered on, and this is the reason. Um, it waits for a signal, so when you push the button on your laptop or on, on your computer, on PS on, so it's the the one on the, the fourth on the right, or uh, it waits for PS on to be put to the ground, and then it will pour off. Uh, for one, sorry. So um, it would be great if we had it, uh, if we had the, the the power supply to be always on for the non-ATX power supply because you don't have to push a, a button or anything. So we just shortcut this one for non-ATX power supply boards. But for full, uh, for ATX power supply board, you need anything else because uh, they have a power supply for. We have a power supply for each board, so you have the full socket, this one, put on the board, and then you will have to uh, manually push the button to start the board. It's not really what automation is. So we had to cut this green wire and put it in the in a relay. So that's how we uh, control the power supply for ATX uh, supplied boards. I think that's all. Yeah. So now. We know how to control the power supply of boards, but now we, we should get the serial of the board. <laughs> I mean, if we don't have that, we, we can't have uh, automation. So uh, basically, all the boards are working with a USB to serial, whatever. So TTL, DNF, uh, D9, or I don't know, a lot of uh, USB cable. So lots of USB uh, hubs. So <laughs> yeah, that was really. Hard to find uh, 10 ports USB hub, uh, which was reliable, uh, reliable, and we have to uh, 
be sure also it's uh, externally powered. So it's not um, relying on USB power. Because uh, some boards on the serial port, they just draw current. So if they all draw currents at the same time, then your USB hub just shut down. So you lose the serial connection. So yeah, that's it for the serial connection. And then we have to get files on the, on the board. So uh, on the, the bootloader. And so the bootloader, as you know, uh, mainly uh, support two different types. So either fastboot or TFTP protocols. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> and so TFTP protocol is way more uh, uh, used. And so we needed a lot of switches and Ethernet uh, cables. So <laughs> it was free. You will see then the, the pictures. It's really a lot of cables. Um, and which was also gigabit uh, switches. So if later we want to test uh, the bandwidth be between two devices, we can do it uh, up to a gigabyte, a uh, gigabit, sorry. Um, so now with the actual building of the, the board farm. So um, we had some requirements. We have only a limited space at the, at the office. So a specific location, uh, it was, really a requirement to be harmless to board, uh, yeah, harmless to board. Uh, so, what does that mean? I mean, you don't want to have a, a shelf with a uh, metal uh, thing, so you just shortcut every board you have. So, we, we went with uh, wood, but also you have to uh, maintain the, the board at the same place, because some boards are really tiny, like the chip, so it's this big. And as you know, the Ethernet cable are really rigid, so it would just go wherever you want. So we went with a scratch. So you just have to scratch the, the board, and it would just stay in place. Uh, we wanted something easy to use. So for our use case, we just want sometimes to pick a board from the lab. So if everything is fixed, then you have to put your, your arms behind every board. It's not really easy to do. So that's why we went with drawers. So it's also allowing evolution. So if uh, a day you want to add a board or add a, a drawer, you can. And we wanted as many boards up as possible. So we established there can be eight small boards, we call it, board drawers, or four big boards, so the boards powered with a uh, full ATX power supply. So now, we divided this in two different kind of drawers, the small drawers and the big drawers. So small drawers are drawers with a um, uh, non ATX power uh, supplied uh, board. So basically we put in one, I uh, uh, think it's 70 per 95 centimeters drawer a 10 port USB hub, which is uh, linked to the, to the server. Then you, we have a two 8 port switches to get files on, in the bootloader of each board. The um, ATX port supply, which uh, has its both um, voltage output uh, put into uh, 8 ports of the relay, which is uh, linked to the port switches to the to, sorry to the Ethernet switches, so it can be uh, controlled by the server, and then you just have all the Ethernet cable on the middle, in the middle, and you just put wherever you can you, the devices. So it's just really uh, it depends on how the well the, the size of your devices. So that's how it looks like. Looks like that's the last version. That's a lot of cable. Um, so you have everything on the middle, the serial, the Ethernet cable. Uh, so on top, you, can, you can't really see it. Uh, on the right, you have the ATX port supply. Then the relay with all the dominoes, I think that's called. And then the eight port switches, and then 10, 10 USB ports. Um, yeah, you, you could spare some place with a shorter uh, cables. That's, that's ongoing development, I would say, uh, ongoing work. So that's it for the small drawers, big drawers, so drawers of boards uh, with full ATX supply. 
So every, uh, any each each board has its own uh, attack for supply. So that's uh, a scheme because every board has a different uh, uh, size. So uh, basically, it's not really relevant here. Uh, so the next one is the picture in real life. So you have on the right, you have the first uh, attack for supply with the board. So and yeah, it's really, it really depends, the, the, um, the organization of the droid depends on the size and model of your boards. But now here you, we have uh, four boards, that's the maximum <laughs> we can put uh, another one in this. Uh, so that's full attacks for supply. So um, I don't know if you can see, uh, do you see the, red, the, the green wires? So these are re uh, directly linked to the attacks for supply. No, nothing to do with the, the ball directly, only with the, the attic for supply. That's how we pour it. I think it's okay, yeah. So, how does it look like? That's big, right? So, it's two meter high. We have eight uh, drivers, so up to uh, 50 boards, I would say. Um, so, it's still, as you can see, uh, a mess. Um, it's still undergoing uh, uh, work, so um, yeah, that's it. So uh, I will let uh, Antoine do uh, small feedback on the board farm, and then I will continue. Yep. So some feedbacks on uh, what we did, and well, what failed, uh, what worked. Uh, yeah. Uh, we launched it uh, at the end of April uh, this year, and we have currently 35 boards in it, uh, with, uh, as I said, contain an estimated capacity of 50 boards. Uh, for uh, was as of now, I think we had a look last week uh, at the numbers. We had more than 160k tests uh, on more than 30 unique boards in kernel CI. So that means we added 35 boards uh, in kernel CI, but 30 of them are unique to kernel CI. This is good, actually, and this is why uh, everybody should add uh, a farm of board into kernel CI, because a lot of companies have access to unique boards uh, that are not available uh, well by the whole community. Um, so some challenges, because uh, you may assume uh, it will just work, but actually, when you're doing something like this, um, well, the actual test of the boards will be pretty much uh, straightforward, but then uh, you will need to debug uh, your test automation uh, software and hardware, and this is maybe one uh, tricky part. Um, because you will encounter uh, some, uh, well, failures and some uh, uh, new uh, or unexpected uses of a uh, Linux uh, server. Um, for example, we have, uh, as Quentin said, uh, many devices connected uh, to the Lava dispatcher. And so this means you will have lots of connection uh, through Ethernet or USB to a single machine. Uh, for example, we had issues uh, with uh, using USB with a lot of devices connected to the same machine, and we had to recompile our kernel to be able, well, ju just to have uh, the machine work working. Um, so this was one tricky part. Um, also, if you have a look at the board, uh, every board will be different, so you will have to deal with specific boot configuration. Um, we, for example, you can have many boards uh, with a modified version of U-Boot, which is not mainline, and you will have to deal with it. Uh, maybe it will be heavily modified, and so you won't be able to use uh, command commands to be to, to boot a kernel, so, or maybe you will need to use a specific uh, format for your image to be able to boot on this board, so you, uh, you will have to deal with this. Uh, you may have to deal with hardware modifications, uh, because some board will need, to, uh, will need you to press a button to be able to boot it, so if you want to automate the boot, then you will have to remove this button, uh, so it can be, well, one hardware modification. And also you can deal with all bootloaders, because, well, uh, the board is maybe not supported into mainline U-Boot again, and for example, in our lab, we have one really old version of U-Boot from 2004, uh, so it was U-Boot 1.1.1, uh, which is quite old. So you have to deal with this. Um, the third point is really uh, important. Just expect everything to fail. Uh, you, will expect fa you, you will have failure in every part uh, of your lab. Uh, when testing it, um, 
sometimes uh, kernel CI guys will tell you that a board is not working. Uh, it may be not related to the board actually, but it may be related to your farm. So you again will have to deal with this. Um, so for example, you can have buggy serial connections, uh, software services uh, or machines that are not working across reboots. Uh, so we had every uh, everything I told you, uh, we had it. Uh, so we had to fix everything uh, on this slide. Um, um, well, last but not least, uh, Lava is one implementation of uh, uh, software testing. So it assumes uh, that the board are working in a certain way, and sometimes it's just not true. So you may have to patch Lava uh, for uh, well uh, a given set of board uh, just to have them working in your lab. Okay. So it can be uh, quite scary, but uh, well, it's really useful, useful to do it, and it's not that difficult to to fix this. Uh, you just need time. Um, some more documentation. Uh, well, maybe the most, well, not most important point, but uh, what we say today, we have a lot of uh, articles on our blog. Uh, not every one of them was published yet, but we will have a detailed uh, blog article on the hardware part, uh, software part, kernel uh, CI part, I guess, maybe. No? Yep. And um, well, also about the last part we will present you just after the slide. Um, well, on top of this link, uh, you have uh, everything that is related to kernel CI or Lava. So this is the actual documentation. As said, Quentin, uh, there are two versions of Lava, so the documentation may not be uh, fully updated uh, or may not uh, specify if it's for the version 1 or 2 of Lava. So it can be also quite uh, tricky to understand it. But well, again, it's not that complicated. So you, you need time and you need uh, to have Quentin uh, in your uh, office. <laughs> Um, last part, uh, remote control. So we presented you how to build a board of farm, uh, how to integrate it into kernel CI, but you can also use it for other purposes. Uh, we will just show one of them to you. Uh, we are a bit um, short on time, but well, it's uh, the break after, so it should be okay. Uh, so one of the uses we wanted to, to have with our farm uh, was to um, use it remotely because we have some engineers at React uh, which are working uh, at home remotely so they do not have access to all the board we can have in our office in Toulouse for example. Um, we also have some board uh, only once so if you want to, to use them to develop and to use them into kernel CI at the same time uh, then well it's quite complicated to remove them from the uh, board farm every time you want to test something new and to put it again uh, every day for kernel CI to be able to run the tests. Um, and well, one important point, uh, well, nice one, is that you have a board of farm, so it's fully automated. You just need a tool to be able to use it manually. And so this is what we did. Uh, well, we did. Quentin did. Um, and it's called, uh, well, Lavabo. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just uh, a small follow up on the, uh, on the farm. Uh, you can have uh, help from the community uh, at the uh, uh, mailing list. So uh, I've not noted it, but you, it's easy to find on the on, on the uh, on the internet, and it's really useful. So they they are quick to answer, and yeah, that was a great help for me. Uh, so uh, quickly because we have no no time. Uh, Lavabo. So uh, for Lavabo, uh, Lava board overseer, yeah. Well, we find the, the job before. Um, so it reuses the same tools Lava uses. So we want it uh, to be Kiss. So keep it simple and stupid. Um, so it will just literally reuse any tool Lava uses, and will take full control as Lava is doing. And it will authenticate users, so it's, it's really important uh, within a, a team of engineers. So two people cannot access the same board at the same time, and it has to be uh, to be fully compatible with Lava. So, for example, uh, if we uh, work on a board, we don't want it to run uh, kernel CI jobs, for example. So, for that, remember the the small scheme I showed you uh, at the beginning. Now, Lava is on on green. So basically, it will just read. Uh, you will install Lavabo server on your uh, server machine, so on the uh, on the master of Lava, 
Uh, it will read configuration file to know how to connect to the serial, uh, how to pour uh, on or off the boards, where to find it. Um, then you will install a, a Lavabo client, so called Lavabo, on your uh, computer, so on your engineer computer. You will connect via SSH, and you will get a serial connection via SSH port redirection, and files will be uh, uploadable, I, I would say, uh, to the TFTP directory accessible to devices via SFTP. So that's a quick uh, uh, introduction to Lavabo, but there is more on the, on the documentation, but I will let. Uh, and ju just one thing, uh, Lavabo server is not a daemon. Uh, so, well, it's not something that is running, uh, well, every time. Okay. So, yeah, uh, it will just run once uh, the Lavabo client is calling it. So, it's not really uh, eating your resources. Uh, Lavabo is a client server mo uh, based on a client server model. So, as I said, uh, the server must be on this. So, yeah, some requirements. The server must be on the same machine as where Lava is server is hosted. So, diff uh, multiple dispatchers are not yet uh, uh, handled, supported. So, no support for multi-node Lava. Uh, you have to have one dedicated uh, SSH Unix users on your Lava master, so it can uh, connect via SSH. You have one SSH key per Lavabo real users, so one SSH key per engineer, so you can authenticate them. Um, and uh, Lava's connection commands, so the way you, uh, you get your server connection on Lava should be telnet for uh, yet. Maybe we'll, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, help us to get uh, Conmax support. And there is no support for rootfs uh, on NFS, uh, because that's quite hard. Uh, we'll have to deal with uh, port redirection and uh, things like that. It's not really easy, and we don't have a lot of boards booting on NFS yet, so we'll maybe work on that later. So, uh, typical workflow. So, Lavabo uh, allow you to uh, uh, list all the devices available on Lava server. Uh, it gives you the host names uh, from when uh, it is offline, so since when. And then you have the, set, the status of each board and who uh, put it offline. So, for example, we have Omar, who um, reserved the Armada 3720 on uh, September 21. So, that was two weeks ago. Please release it. Uh, so, you have to reserve it. So, for example, for the chip, you reserve the board, so now it is attached, uh, linked to your uh, SSH uh, key. So you are the only one uh, of, um, allowed to access it. Then well, you can upload your kernel, your DTB, your rootfs, whatever, to your DT, uh, sorry, uh, TFTP uh, directory on the server. And then reset will uh, power reset your board. So basically, you will just uh, connect to the serial. So that's done on the on the, the engineer laptop, you will get the serial and then you can reset the board if uh, it fails to boot, so the kernel crash or whatever. And uh, you pour it off and then you release. Omar, release it, please. So, uh, that's it for the, the small presentation of Lavabo. Uh, I hope we have we have time to, uh, well, do a little demo, but We'll see. Uh, some limitations, so as I said, no uh, NFS uh, for rootfs, uh, a, sim a single node, so no multiple dispatchers yet. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we can work on that. You can help us too, because uh, yeah, well, it's G G uh, GNU uh, GPL v2 license, so we can work on that too. It's on our GitHub for that. Uh, we have also the Lava uh, configuration file on a different uh, repository, but you can, uh, yeah, steal them. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think that's it for the for me. So I will let uh, Antoine finish the, the talk, no? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, we maybe have time for one or two questions. And if you want to stay just after, maybe you have five minutes just after the question to show you how Lavabo is working. Uh, but first, questions, if you have maybe one or two questions. So do you want to build a, b b a firm of board on your own? No? Okay, well. <laughs> yes, there is a microphone here. Yep. If you want. No, but there is a yeah, microphone, yeah. Um, is the 
uh, relay board, is it free to get the um, layout and software, firmware? Is it open hardware? Sorry? The um, relay board, is it open hardware? Oh, open hardware. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, it's mostly because we didn't really document uh, how to build it. So we don't have the steps how to build it, but if you ask us, like, there is no problem, we can help you. But no, it's not really open hardware, because for us it was really a specific location, so yeah, and it, after all, it's, all it's, it's just a shelf with drawers. So yeah, on the, on the hardware part, I think it's, it's okay. But yeah, we didn't build it, actually, the, power, the relay uh, board. Uh, so we just have to, to buy it. Uh, it's not open hardware, but if you want to build one, then uh, just build one. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, second question. Uh, do we have the microphone? Um, does Lavabo uh, connect with a real uh, Lava database and takes the boards from the Lava database so uh, kernel CI does not connect with the board? And no, it's not related to kernel CI. Uh, it's related to the configuration files of uh, Lava. So Quentin showed you uh, these configuration files with uh, yeah, well, how to power board and it will read this configuration file to know which boards are available and how to control them. Yeah, but so, um, um, you have to dis dis uh, connect the board from the Lava database, so nobody can, on the Lava, Lava status, can connect to it, and you are the only permitted person. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you need access uh, through SSH to your uh, machine, and so you need a key uh, to be able to do this. So this is, uh, well, it's uh, secured by the SSH protocol, uh, so it's not, well, our implementation, but it's already working. Well, I hope it's working. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think the question was, uh, how do we, sorry, uh, how do we say uh, to Lava how it, uh, now it's off Lava. So we added a, an endpoint in the API to say that. So now we just have to uh, call the API and just say, release the board, um, reserve the board, or yeah, put it outside, on, uh, inside the Lava, virtually, yeah? This could be a good part of Lava itself. I think it would be nice to have a job like uh, I added my own job for this Lava device now and I can communicate with it. So it could be an own implementation plug-in for Lava. Yeah, okay. Um, the problem is um, Lava is done to automate tests, not to take control of the port. So uh, I don't know, maybe we can work with Lava to do that, but yet it's I think it's not really the purpose of uh, Lava. Okay. No. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>